Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Shall we lift our hands and put our hands together and celebrate Jesus? He's faithful and he's a good God. Amen and amen. Good evening. Praise the Lord. I want to thank God so much for the opportunity to be here tonight to share with God's people in the one and only Harvest Youth Conference 2018. It's a big privilege. I don't take it for granted. I'm so grateful. And I want to honor our bishop who apparently knew me before I entered my mother's womb. And I thank God so much for him. He's a blessing. I salute all the ministers in the house, uh, both from within and without. May the Lord richly bless you. As well as also the many church members that have joined in tonight just to support the young people. It's a blessing to have you and we're excited you're here. Amen. Are you ready for the word of God? I want to share with us tonight on what I've entitled, Understanding the Kingdom. Understanding the Kingdom. This has been declared to us as the year of kingdom manifestation. And I feel it's necessary for us to understand what this kingdom is. Because if we don't understand it, we are not able to manifest it. And I still believe even with the remaining time before 2018 is over, God will enable you and I to, able to manifest his kingdom. Can I hear you say amen? amen? We'll be having a number of scriptures to go through, so the media team, you'll just flow with me. We are working with the New King James Version, and it's going to be wonderful. We begin from the book of Luke chapter 12 and verse number 32. Luke chapter number 12 and verse number 32. The Bible says, do not fear little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I want us to read it together on the screen, Luke 12 and verse number 32. Let's read it together. Do not fear little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Touch yourself and say, it pleases God to give to me his kingdom. Amen. Now let's go to Colossians chapter 1, verse number 13 to verse number 14. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 13 to verse number 14. Once again, it's on the screen and we are going to read it together because tonight we shall preach together. Amen. Let's read it together. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Verse number 14, verse 14 on the screen, verse number 14, All right, let's go. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Say together with me, God is pleased to give me the kingdom. Now say this with me, the blood of Jesus is what transfers me from the power of darkness into the kingdom. Can you say amen? Now this is what is surprising me when I look at the body of Christ today. The word tells us that the blood of Jesus has done a work. And the work that the blood has done is that it has delivered us from the power of darkness and then it has translated us. It has moved us into another place which is called the kingdom of the son of his love. Can I hear you say amen? Now this is the surprise that I have. The surprise I have is that the body of Christ is very concerned about the powers of darkness. You'll be surprised how many believers want to know about things like magic, illuminati, and many things of the power of darkness. But tonight I came to tell you that you don't belong in those places. There is something that happened when you received Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior. The word of God declares that he delivered you. So tonight I'm not preaching to people that are under a curse or under oppression, but I'm preaching to a people that have been translated, a people that have been moved, a people that belong to the kingdom of God. If you're in the kingdom, say, I belong to the kingdom. Can I hear you say amen? So tonight, I decree over your life, you will not waste your time trying to understand devil worshippers, illuminati, and all of these things. But you will take your time to understand the kingdom of God. You see, if you're moving houses, you don't concentrate on where you came from. 
Kama unahama. No, you don't consent. You don't buy curtains for the house you have left. You don't buy chairs for the house you have left. You don't buy anything for that old house. As long as you know that you are moving, your focus is in where you are going. And tonight I decree over your life, we are going to focus on where you belong. We are going to focus on the kingdom of God. Somebody say amen. Now let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9 to verse number 10. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9 to verse number 10. Let's have it on the screen and let us read it together. Everyone, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Verse number 10. Who once were not a people, but are now the people of God. Who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Let's go back to verse number 9. The word of God shows us an identity that we possess. We are told that we are a chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are his own special people. That is the identity that we carry as God's people. So tonight I have an announcement for you. I am not a hustler and you are not a hustler and you're not a sufferer. There is another identity that you have been given. You are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are God's own special people. So tonight I come against every identity that has been thrown at you. And I decree to you in the name of Jesus that because you belong to the kingdom of God, you are a chosen generation. You may not have been chosen by your teacher. You may not have been chosen by your friends. But there is a God in heaven who through the cross of Christ, he chose you into his kingdom. High five your neighbor and tell them, I am chosen. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. I'm going to land in a short while. What is the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of God? Go through together with me. Number one, the kingdom of God is the reason why Jesus came. The kingdom of God is the reason why Jesus came. In the book of Isaiah chapter number 9, verse number 6 to verse number 7. The kingdom is the reason why Jesus came. Isaiah 9 verse number 6 to 7. The Bible says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace. There will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now many years before Christ is born, Isaiah gives a prophecy. He says that there is going to be a child that is going to be born. There's going to be a son that is going to be given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. Say together with me, the government will be upon his shoulder. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 2 and verse number 1 to verse number 2. Matthew chapter number 2, verse number 1 to verse number 2. The Bible said, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem. Verse number 2, let's read it together on the screen. Saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the is and have come to worship him. Say together with me, where is he who has been born king? Now it's important for you to understand that when Jesus was born, he was not just born as a baby boy alone, but he was also born as a king. You know, in the government that we have of the day, we operate by democracy. We are able to vote in a president and we vote him out of power. But when we are talking about the kingdom, there is no voting of the king, but there is something that happens to the king. The king is born as a king. So I want you to know when Jesus entered this world, he did not enter as a baby boy alone, but he entered as a king. Say together with me, the kingdom. Is the reason why Jesus came. 
Matthew chapter 11 and verse number 28. One day Jesus is preaching and he says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Verse number 29, he says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Say together with me, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Isaiah prophesied and he said when he will be born, he will come with a government upon his shoulder. And now he's preaching to the people and he tells them, come unto me. This is what I'm going to do. I am going to give you rest. You will learn from me and you will take my yoke upon you. A yoke is an instrument that puts two animals together so that they can be able to plow. They can be able to farm. The yoke normally sits on the shoulders and it sits on the neck. So Isaiah said that the kingdom is coming with Christ upon his shoulder and Jesus is preaching and he says to the people take my yoke upon you because my yoke is easy and my burden is light tonight I want you to know the yoke of Jesus Christ is something called the kingdom because when he says take my yoke he means the thing that I am carrying you need it in your life and when you take it upon yourself he gives the promise that my yoke is easy and my burden is light tonight I came to decree in the year of kingdom manifestation. Your life is not supposed to be difficult. You're not supposed to be struggling because the yoke is easy and the burden is light. I decree over your life the kingdom of God so that your life can be easy and your burdens can be light. Put your hands together for the kingdom of God. Oh yes. I declare to you 2018 must be easier than 2017. Your amen is looking for vitamin C. Let me say that again. 2018 must be better than 2017. Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Look at your neighbor. Tell them the kingdom makes your life easy. And the burdens light. May you receive the kingdom in Jesus name. It pleases God to give you the kingdom. It pleases God. So there are people here, the days ahead of your life, they are not supposed to be more difficult than where you came from. The word declares that the path of a righteous man, it shines brighter and brighter. So I declare to you, the best days of your life are not behind you. They are right in front of you. Can you say amen? Look at the book of Luke chapter number 4, verse number 42 to 43. Luke chapter number 4, verse number 42 to verse number 43. The Bible says, now when it was day, he departed and went into a deserted place. And the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. Verse 43, but he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also because for this purpose, I have been sent. He said, I've got to preach this kingdom because people have been under heavy yokes. People have been under heavy oppression. Religion of the day has bound people. People have been living life below their privilege. People have been living life as not intended by God. But I must preach the kingdom of God because this is the purpose to which I came. And I want you to know the purpose of Christ has never changed even over 2,000 years ago. He's still preaching the kingdom to you because your life has got to be easy. And your burdens have got to be light. High five your neighbor and tell them the kingdom is the reason why Jesus came. Oh yes, in the book of John 18, verse number 37. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Jesus confirmed I am a king. He confirmed I came to preach the kingdom. He confirmed that yes, his kingdom is not even of this world and he also declares this is the cause for which he came. I want you to know tonight the kingdom is the reason why Jesus came. What is the kingdom? Number two, the kingdom is God's spirit ruling the hearts of men. The kingdom is God's spirit ruling the hearts of men. 
God's spirit ruling the hearts of men. The book of Luke chapter 17 and verse number 20 to verse number 21. Luke chapter number 17 from verse number 20 to verse number 21. The Bible says, now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Touch yourself and say, the kingdom of God is within me. Say it again, the kingdom of God is within me. What does this mean? Look at the book of Romans chapter 14 and verse 17 to 18. Romans chapter 14 verse number 17 to verse number 18. The Bible says for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. Let's read the next line together. But righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Verse number 18. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Say with me, the kingdom of God is the spirit of God ruling inside of me. I believe with the whole of my heart one of the reasons why we are where we are as a country, dealing with very severe cases of corruption, dealing with very severe cases of poor leadership. Everywhere you look around, there is so much confusion. We cannot arrange our roads. We cannot arrange our drainage. We cannot sort ourselves out. It is not because we are a caste people, but it is because the leaders that we have, there is something else that is ruling their hearts. That's why somebody can steal money that is meant for medicine. And he doesn't even care what is going to happen to the general public. I want you to understand the answer to our country is not another political party. The answer to our country is not any other human agenda. There is another answer to our country. It is called the kingdom of God. The spirit of the living God ruling the hearts of men. When the spirit rules your heart, you will not steal from your employer. Even if you don't say amen, it's still a point. Oh, you will never steal because there is something that is ruling your heart. I pray for our young people tonight that the Holy Ghost himself will come upon you in power and it shall rule your heart. Somebody say amen. Lift your hand and say Holy Spirit, rule over my life. Rule over my life. When he rules over men, they will be faithful in their families. When he rules over you, there are things you will never do. Why? Because the kingdom of God is within you. You know that the Holy Ghost is ruling me. And the word says in Romans 8, 14, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Not many who are led by the swag of the day. Not many who are led by the fashion of the day. Not many who are led by celebrities. Not many who are led by the media. But as many as are led by the spirit of God. These are the sons of God. Are there sons of God here tonight? Let me hear you say I am a son. In the kingdom of God. Clap your hands together for the kingdom of God. Is God's spirit ruling the hearts of men. What is the kingdom of God? Number three, the kingdom of God is a different culture. The kingdom of God is a different culture. This means a different way of thinking and a different way of behavior. That is the kingdom of God is a different culture. It's a different way of thinking. It's a different way of behavior. When we talk about manifesting the kingdom, we are talking about people exhibiting a different way of thinking. People exhibiting a different way of behavior. Look at the book of Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 25. If we can have it in the King James Version. Matthew 6 and verse number 25. And I want us to read it together on the screen. Three go everyone. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Repeat that line again. Take no thought for your life. Say it again. In other words, Jesus is speaking to his disciples and is telling them, there is a way you think about life. And I don't want you to think that way. What you shall eat or what you shall drink, 
nor yet for your body. What you shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. In other words, the people of that day, there were things that were moving them. They were very concerned about three things. What they're going to eat, what they're going to drink, and what they're going to put on. And it's not a surprise. Even in our day and time, these three things are very strong motivators. What am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What am I going to put on? It is a way of thinking that is characterized even in our generation. As a matter of fact, you'll even hear political leaders make the statement, this is our turn to eat. So we are not depending on them to provide answers to our situations. These are characters that want to eat. Tell your neighbor the kingdom. is a different way of thinking. What does he say? Look at verse number 26. Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Verse 28. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. How they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Verse number 30. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Verse 32. For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Verse number 33. Let's read it together on the screen. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Can I hear you say amen? amen. You know, when your life is driven by what you shall eat, what you shall drink, what you shall wear, you will never care whatever is demanded from you. That is why a young person can sell his body, can sell her body simply because of what she's going to eat, what she's going to drink, what she's going to put on. But Jesus said, don't think that way. There is something greater you can live for. Oh, I came to preach to you tonight. When somebody looked at you and judged you because of the clothes that you put on, they had no idea that your life is greater than the clothes that you have. Your life is greater than the car you drive. Your life is greater greater than where you stay. Take no thought of these things. Can you say amen? amen? Take no thought of them. Let not your life be driven by those small things. But there is something else that can drive you. He said seek fast the kingdom of God. And when you do this and seek his righteousness, he says all these things that other people are chasing after, he gives you the assurance they shall be added to you. Oh, I declare in 2018 that as you seek the kingdom of God, may there be an addition in your life. May there be an addition in your finances. May there be an addition in the things you desire. Oh, may there be an addition. Receive your addition in Jesus' name. I say receive your addition in Jesus' name. Look at Look at your neighbor and tell them, my addition will come. Oh yes, it is coming. I declare it is coming. I say it is coming. It shall be added to you. As you seek the kingdom of God, it shall be added to you. It shall come. So in the kingdom of God, we don't judge people by what they have or what they don't have. Those ones are called additions. Tell your neighbor they are additions. Tell them they come as I seek the kingdom. Oh yes, and they are coming. May God give you a testimony of additions in Jesus' name. May he add unto you and fulfill the promises given. May you have a new song to sing by December 31st. That there is an addition into your life. Somebody shout, I receive. Shout again, I receive. Shout again, I receive. Clap your hands together with a shout. For additions coming to you. Because you seek the kingdom. Yes, you seek the kingdom. What is the kingdom of God? Number four, the kingdom is heavenly influence on earthly affairs. The kingdom of God is heavenly influence on earthly affairs. Heavenly influence on earthly affairs. The book of Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 10. The kingdom is heavenly influence on earthly affairs. The Bible said, your kingdom come. 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is a prayer model that Jesus was giving to his disciples. He told them when you pray, pray this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This simply means there is a will of God for you that is in heaven. And you need to pull that will of God from heaven down here on the earth. And how do you do that? Jesus said you've got to pray in this way. That thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I have good news for you here tonight. The will of God for you in heaven is for you not to walk in defeat and to walk in failure. None of God's creation is supposed to suffer the way that we are suffering. There is a will in heaven that is meant for us to prosper and to be victorious. And tonight I pray, may God baptize you with the grace of prayer that when you begin to pray, the kingdom of God will come for you and the will of God shall happen in your life. Lift your hand and say, oh God, give me the grace to pray. Because when you pray, the kingdom comes. Can I hear you say amen? One man called Zachariah, say together with me, Zachariah. And because the young people are here tonight, I will call him Zach. So Zach is a pastor and he's serving in the temple. He's on duty. And while he's serving, an angel appears. And the angel tells him, I have come to tell you that you are going to get a son in your life. And Zachariah says, no, 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 no. You don't know me. You don't know my story. I am an old man. My wife is well advanced in years. What you're saying can never happen. And the angel says, no, my name is Gabriel and I stand in the presence of God. In other words, I am coming from another dimension where we don't know the impossibility that you are saying. I stand in the presence of God and where God is, all things are possible. And he tells him, Zachariah, whether you like it or not, this one is going to happen. And because I don't want you to spoil the process, I will close your mouth. He closed the mouth. And for nine months, Zachariah could not say anything until the word of the Lord had to be fulfilled. People had called them all sorts of names. People had called Elizabeth all sorts of names. They said she was barren. They said that nothing could ever happen to her. They said Zachariah made a mistake to marry such a person. This is not supposed to be his destiny in life. But I came to tell you, when the will of God hits your life, even the testimony and the history of your life will be turned around. And it is my prayer in the remaining time of 2018, may the will of God for you that will change your story be manifested. I say may it be manifested. Oh, there are people here, your story must change in Jesus' name. I say it must change in Jesus' name. You never had a good song. You never had a good name. You never had a good history. But I'm here to tell you if you can pray, there is a will in heaven. That will be manifested for you. Lift your hand and say, oh God, give me the grace to pray. Oh yes. And the scripture records, Elizabeth, who was called barren, now had a son. Why? Because there is a will of God in heaven. And it doesn't matter how long a problem has been. When your season has come for a turnaround, there will be a turnaround. And tonight I sense in my spirit, there are people in this building, a turnaround is overdue for you. And I declare receive your turnaround. I say receive your turnaround. I say receive your turnaround. I say receive your turnaround. Clap your hands together for the kingdom of God. It's heavenly influence. On earthly affairs, Jacob wrestled with a man. And the man told him, what is your name? Jacob said, my name is Jacob. And Jacob means a supplanter, a con man, a cheat. A Mutu wakupanda watu wanapangika. The angel said, no, 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 no. There's another record that I know. The record that I know, your name is Israel, which means a prince together with God. I'm here to tell you, when the grace of God to pray comes over you, even the very name of your life is going to change. Utaacha kuitwa ule mtu wa kusota sota, ule mtu omba omba, ule mtu wa mechanganyikiwa. You shall have a new name because the will of God in heaven must happen on the earth. Lift your hand and say, oh God, may your kingdom come and may your will be done. In my life, 
as it is in heaven. Can you say amen? Number five, what is the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of God? Number five, the kingdom of God is the believer's mandate to transform nations. The believer's mandate to transform nations. The believer's mandate to transform nations. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1, verse number 4 to verse number 6. Revelation chapter number 1, verse number 4 to verse number 6. The word says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Verse number 5, let's read it together. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Verse number 6, read it with a strong voice. And has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Declare with me and say the blood of Jesus washed my sins. And the same blood gave me an identity. I am a king and I am a priest. Can I hear you say amen? amen? So tonight I want you to know you are not just the last born in your family. The devil is a liar. The blood has made you a king. The blood has made you a priest. All the blood of Jesus has given you an identity. Can I hear you say I am a king and I am a priest because of the blood. Now look at this. A priest deals in spiritual affairs. That's what a priest does. And a king deals with natural affairs. Are you following me? So the blood of Jesus has equipped us to operate in spiritual dimensions. And also to operate on earthly dimensions. And for a long time, the church has done very well in the priestly dimension. But the reason why things around us are not working, systems are not good, things are not pleasurable, is because we have not taken up our kingly mandate. But I thank God for this year, the year of kingdom manifestation. Because there are kings in this service, you are going to manifest. And every form of disorder around you, you will put it in order because you are a king. Can I hear you say amen? Look at your neighbor and tell them you're a priest and you are a king. Turn to the other one on the other side and tell them you're a priest and you are a king. Can I hear you say amen? Now let me show you what is the mandate that we have. Revelation chapter 11 and verse number 15. Revelation 11 and verse number 15. I want us to read it on the screen together. Everyone, then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. Say with me, the kingdoms of this world. Say it again, the kingdoms of this world must become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Can you say amen? amen. So tell your neighbor, the blood has made you a king and a priest. That means wherever you have been placed in life, whether by your profession, by your skills, or even by assignment, what you're supposed to do is to take over that mountain of influence and cause the influence of the kingdom of God in that sphere where you are. Can I hear you say amen? So that means not every one of us will be called to be here on the pulpit. Right there where you are, there is a kingdom that God has allowed you to be. And you've been planted there by Jehovah to make sure that you excel in that place so that Jesus can become king of kings. Can you say amen? Now we are moving on. Micah chapter 4 and verse number 1 to verse number 2. Micah chapter 4, verse number 1 to verse number 2. 
aha uh-huh. let's read it on the screen church now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the lord's house shall be established yes 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 verse number 2 many nations shall come and say come and let us go up to the mountain of the lord to the house of the god of jacob he will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths for out of zion the lord shall go forth and the word of the lord from jerusalem can you say amen there are three things in this prophecy i want you to note three things number 1 there is a time frame there is a time frame. We are told this is going to happen in the latter days. The King James Version says in the last days. So that is the time frame that we have. Number two, there are two significant places. Two significant places mentioned in the prophecy. Number one is the mountain of the Lord's house. Then we are also told the other mountains. We are told that this mountain is going to rise above the other mountains. So those are the two places. We have the mountain of the Lord's house and then we have the other mountains. If you're together, say we are together. Right, number three, in the prophecy, we are told of transformational activity. We are told of transformational activity. We are told that nations are going to come. And when these nations come, there is something that's going to happen. They are going to be taught the ways of the Lord, the paths of the Lord. They will be taught the word of God so that they can be able to go out and to declare that out of Zion, the word of the Lord is going to come forth. Can I hear you say amen? Now, when are the last days? When are the last days? Look at the book of Acts chapter 2 verse number 16 to verse number 17. Acts chapter 2 verse number 16 to verse 17. The Bible says, but this is what? That which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Look at verse 17. Let's read it together. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Say together with me, the last days began after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we are told the last days, what's going to happen? The Spirit of God is going to be poured out. And we know the Spirit has already been poured out. So look at your neighbor and tell them we are living in the last days. Question number two, what is the mountain of the Lord's house? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 22. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 22. Hebrews 12 and verse number 22. Uh -huh. Let's read it together. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. Verse 23. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. To God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. Verse number 24. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that. Of Abel. Let's go back to verse number 22. All these names that you see here are referring to one thing and that is the church. You have come to Mount Zion. The prophecy talks about the mountain of the Lord's house. We are told that in Mount Zion is also the city of the living God. We are told it's the heavenly Jerusalem. We are told that right here there is an innumerable company of angels. I have news for you tonight. When you enter this place, demons could not follow you in here because there is an innumerable company of angels. We are also told this is the general assembly. It's the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. We are told right here, God the judge of all is here. And the spirits of just men are made perfect here. Somebody say, I belong to the church. Ah, let's read verse number 24 together. Three go. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Say together with me, we have come to a place where the blood is speaking better. 
Now follow my simple logic. Because there's some of you here, after tonight, you will never live under the fear of witches and witchcraft. Or oh, that one tonight ends in Jesus' name. You see, a witch will take cows and bulls and chicken, slash them, and use their blood for whatever he wants to do. Jesus declared in Matthew chapter number 6 that the value of your life is better than two sparrows. So that means you have animals here, then something greater than animals is a human being. Can I hear you say amen? Now we know from the book of Genesis that when Cain killed his brother Abel, the blood was speaking from the ground, reaching up to God. So even the human blood has got some supernatural dimensions to it. But of good news for you, that when we come to the church, there is something else that is much more superior than the blood of bulls and chicken and goat and even the blood of humans. It is called the blood of Jesus. And tonight I have news for you. That blood is speaking better. Somebody shout three times better. Shout again. Shout again. Somebody shout better. So let the witch do what he wants to do. Let him use whatever blood he wants to use. By straight line equation. The blood of a human is greater than the blood of animals. And the blood of humans cannot be compared to the blood of Jesus. And that blood here tonight is speaking better over you. I decree upon this altar better over you. Oh yes, better in your finances, better in your career, better in your marriage, better with your children, better with your future. Somebody say, I receive better. Shout, I receive better. Shout, I receive better. So tonight I'm here to tell you, the blood that is speaking over you can never, never, never be defeated. By the blood of Ukambani, by the blood of Kisi, by the blood of Nigeria, by the blood of India. There is a blood that is speaking and it is speaking better. Shout for the blood of Jesus. It is speaking better. And we are told that the church shall rise above other hills. So this is the next question. What are the other hills? Let's go to the book of Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter number 4. And verse number 5. Put it up on the screen. We read it together. Luke chapter number 4 and verse number 5. Eesh. Glory be to God. The Bible says, Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Notice that. Kingdoms of the world. Go back. Kingdoms of the world. Tell your neighbor kingdoms of the world. So Jesus is taken up to a high mountain. And the devil shows him the kingdoms of the world. Let's move on. Verse number six. Let's read it together on the screen. And the devil said to him, what did he say? All this authority I will give you and their glory for this has been delivered to me. And I give it to whomever I wish. The devil is claiming something. He says that he has authority. And he can give these kingdoms. To whoever that he wishes. Now let's go to verse number 7. Let's read it together. Therefore, if you will worship before me all. Oh, verse number 8. Let's read it together. What did Jesus say? And Jesus answered and said to him. Yes. Can I shock you? And follow through with me. Jesus in his answer did not question the authority of the devil. He was silent. Because if you push in this idea of the kingdom. You will discover that Adam did not just lose a relationship with God. But he lost dominion over the earth to the devil. So the devil had been in charge from the time of Adam up until this temptation. So Jesus remains quiet. But when he rises on the third day and is about to go to heaven, he gathers his disciples together and he says to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Tonight I want you to know something happened between the temptation and the resurrection of Jesus. There was a change of authority. Tonight I want you to know the devil doesn't have authority the way he claims to have. 
Jesus has all power and authority. Clap your hands together for Jesus with all power and all authority. Hey. Now this is the question. What are these other mountains that the prophecy talked about? These are the kingdoms of this world. Say with me, the kingdoms of this world. Now the kingdoms of this world are platforms of influence. These are the things that determine life for you and life for me. I read a quote from the book by a man called Bishop Tudor Bismarck. And the book is called Increase of the Kingdom. He said this, he said, in every human being, there is a brain. Within every brain, there is a mind. Within every mind, there is a belief system or a culture. And within every belief system, there is a shaper. And every shaper has an agenda. Let me walk you through that. Say together with me, human being. Say brain. Say mind. Say belief system. Or culture. Say shaper. Say agenda. So this simply means this. That somebody with an agenda can position himself in a mountain of influence. And with his agenda, he's going to have a shaper. With the shaper, he'll release a culture or a belief system. And that one is going to take over the minds of people. And ultimately, human beings will begin to move by a particular agenda. So what are these mountains of influence? There are many of them, but let me list the seven as I come to a close. Number one is religion. Say religion. You'll be very surprised. A big portion of the problems we have in the world, especially where security is concerned, is because of religion. Because there are people who believe. If they walk into a building and bomb everybody, they're going to paradise. Say belief. Oh yes, that's why you get searched every place you go. Because somebody has believed something wrong about God. You'll be surprised that when the Pope visits our country, you feel the power of religion. Power of religion. Wherever you are, you get a free public holiday. Because the Pope has come. That's called the power of religion. Otherwise, if the holiday is not given, the kind of traffic jam that will be in this city has never been seen. Somebody say religion. Oh yes. And one of the wrong religions that is misleading people is called Catholicism. Say with me Catholicism. Look at your neighbor. Tell them let's do a Bible study. <laughs> Hallelujah. The Catholic friends that we have, they have esteemed Mary so high and they pray through Mary. If that is true, say it is true. Now, what makes Mary special? You need to understand this. So that you can see the deception that people walk under. The book of Luke, chapter number 1. Luke, chapter number 1. Put up verse number 26. Verse number 26. Luke, chapter 1, verse number 26. Let's read it together. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee. Named what? Right. Verse number 27. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Keep the scripture there. The angel came to a virgin that was betrothed, engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. I put it this way. Prophetic alignment is the only thing that makes Mary special. Not her hair. Not the way she looks in her picture. The devil is a liar. She was just aligned to a man that was coming from the house of David. God had given David a promise. He told him out of your lineage, I am going to raise a king that will sit on your throne forever. If Joseph was engaged to somebody called Nyasuguta, I assure you, the mother of Jesus will be called Nyasuguta. Tell your neighbor deception must be removed. Can I hear you say amen? Catholicism is a serious deception. They say that Peter was the first pope. And as you know, popes never marry. Let's go to Matthew chapter 8. Oh yeah. We are shaking these mountains of influence. I say we are shaking the mountains of influence. Matthew chapter 8 and verse number 17. Matthew 8, 17. Put it up on the screen. Right, let's go back to verse number 14. 14, yes. Verse number 14. 
Yes. Let's read it together. Now when Jesus had come into whose house? What did he see? He saw his Peter was already married. There is no way Peter would have been the Pope because he was married. Tonight I'm here to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ must be preached because there are many in their millions that have been deceived and we must shake the mountain of religion. Can you say amen? amen. Number two is the mountain of education. Education. It matters where you go to school. Some of the agendas of the enemy against this nation and against the next generation have been so strategically positioned that they are taking over the minds of our young people. So you have somebody that finishes primary school, finishes high school, they love the Lord, they were in the Christian Union, we know them in the church. Then they go into university and they meet with a professor that tells them the Bible is an old idea. The Bible is not even supposed to be considered God. He set the world and then he went away. He's an absentee landlord and somebody graduates with honors but without God. That's why I want you to know when you see a church operating a school, it is not for the the purpose of a prophet that is too shallow it is for the purpose of tilting a generation in the direction of God can you say amen and there's some of you sitting here God will empower you with resources so that you can set up institutions of learning for the sake of a generation a generation to know that there is a God number three very quickly my time is running out we have government government is another influencer in society. Government is a serious influencer in society. <laughs> the Bible said this. That righteousness exalts a nation. Say together with me righteousness. Say again righteousness. You'll be shocked to know. That we have presidents of African countries. That shut down churches. They shut them down. We have one president that was so happy to close down churches. He doesn't know what will exalt his country. Is not the consultants that are surrounding him. But there is something called righteousness. And the Bible records that it exalts a nation. Oh, I pray in the name of Jesus. What we need much more in our country are people that have a heart for God. People in power that will cause a nation to rise because of righteousness. And I have good news for you. It is beginning to happen in our country. When you begin to see people being arrested because of corruption, that is an answer to the prayer of the church. There is a purging that is going on. I'm here to tell you, the best days of Kenya are ahead of us. Clap your hands together for righteousness exalting our nation. Number four is the mountain of business. The mountain of business. There are people that carry serious money. Can you say serious? Serious. <laughs> serious. I'm talking of heavy duty money. That whatever they desire to do, nobody can stop them because of the money they have. That's why I pray for you. To come out of the level of squeezing 50 shillings in an offering. To where God will exalt you to have resources. So that the agenda of Jesus Christ and his kingdom can be fulfilled in our land. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Taking over the mountain of business. Listen to me. <laughs> the reason why the church is in a place of shame is because partly we have the lack of resources. Ask your neighbor, neighbor. Have you ever seen a Hindu temple made of mabati and wood? Have you ever seen? You'll never, you'll never meet with a Muslim man asking for your donation to build a mosque. I pray for you that God will prosper you. That some of the shame that is in the body of Christ, out of the resources of your life, we can eradicate it. That the kingdom of God can be exalted. Somebody say hallelujah. Number six is the media. It's a mountain of influence. The media. The media is a mountain of influence. Oh, number five, did I? I mean number five, the media. Okay, let me check it again. Number one was what? Religion. Number two? Number three? Number four? Number five? Media. Yes, we are in the media. Tell your neighbor, neighbor. Two people on a radio station can confuse the institution of marriage 
in Nairobi. Oh, can I preach here tonight? I say, can I preach here tonight? Not many people, how many? Can confuse an entire country. And if you miss them in the morning, they are there in the evening. And there are people that are walking that that toxicity of the things they speak has caught up with you. I have a prayer for you. May God bless you with your own car. Where you choose what you listen to. Because some of these matatus, they are perpetually producing the wrong information to people. Or may you prosper with your own car. Where you can listen to Hope FM 93.3. Where you listen and leave. Because there are other things if you listen you will die. Tell your neighbor the media needs you and me to take over. Tell your neighbor it is time for kingdom take over. Ooh, number six. Arts and entertainment. Arts and entertainment. This one is even major to our young people. Arts and entertainment. One of the best things I ever watched, Pastor Jack, was the World Cup 2002. I, it was a World Cup that I was saying amen, especially in the finals. The World Cup is one of the most watched matches around the world. Countries watch, even countries that don't speak English, they will watch World Cup. Because football is a serious thing. Somebody say serious. Now in the year 2002, Brazil was playing in the finals. Three people in the team of Brazil are born again believers at that particular time. And they decided we are going to take over this mountain of entertainment for the Lord Jesus Christ. We will put on two t-shirts. One will be in black and white and another one will be yellow in color. We shall enter the pitch and we shall begin to play. When we score, it's not time for Brazil to be lifted up. We shall remove the t-shirts. And send a message globally in a matter of seconds. They enter the field. My God. In the few minutes I have, can I preach to you tonight? I say, can I preach to you tonight? They entered into the field. And the referee blew the whistle. And the match was on. This is the final. Everybody is watching it. Everybody is interceding. KPLC, don't dare to remove the electricity. We cannot miss such a moment. It's a moment of history. And they are playing. And they are playing. And all of a sudden, the Brazilian boys begin their samba dance. And the ball is moving from right to left globally H, as if not enough they settled down put on the yellow t-shirts continued playing all of a sudden H, you know when when you lift God higher he even lifts you higher they got some strange wisdom and began to play again and all of a sudden they were heading to the opponent one more time just in case somebody missed the message the next opportunity was available for them this was like the second service that they were coming to preach again yes. they removed the yellow t-shirts and once again jesus is lord once again i belong to jesus once again jesus is god number seven is the mountain of the family the family the family. Proverbs 22, verse number 6. The word of God says, train up a child in the way he should go. That when he's old, he will not depart from it. The family is a training ground of a direction the next generation must be set upon. Can you say Amen. You know, one of the problems we have in this country is tribalism. But the answer to this must go back to the family. You know, there are some people who tell their children, mm -mm, be very careful of this people group. Wakiokoka wanokoka halfway. Wokovu haijai. The devil is a liar. That is why we cannot kill tribalism in this country. Because there are people setting the next generation on a tangent that will continue with the issue of tribalism. I pray for you today that in your family you will set your children in a direction that will give this country future citizens that are Kenya conscious. The prophecy spoke of nations, not tribes, nations. We are supposed to be global influencers. Stop localizing your children into the tribe you came from. Think according to the prophecy. We are here to influence nations. And God is giving you grace to influence nations. If you receive that grace, lift your hand and say, I receive the grace for the mandate to influence nations. 
Can you say amen? Do you receive the word of the Lord tonight? Can you put your hands together for the word of God on understanding the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of God? It is the reason why Jesus came. Look at your neighbor, tell them neighbor. The kingdom is the reason why Jesus came. Therefore, you must agree to prioritize Jesus and to learn from him. The kingdom is God's spirit ruling the hearts of men. Tell your neighbor the kingdom is God's spirit ruling the hearts of men. Tell them my neighbor accept to be led by the spirit of God. Tell them not politics, not issues, not popular trends, but the spirit of God. We've said that the kingdom of God is a different culture. It's a different way of thinking. It's a different way of behavior. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, you have to adjust your thinking to higher and different thought patterns in the word of God. Let me give you an example as I close. You see, in the world, if you want to be promoted, what you do is that you undercut people who are ahead of you. You create a situation for somebody to be fired. Then now you're promoted. You occupy their space. That's how the world operates. But in the kingdom of God, Jesus said, whoever wants to be fast must first become a servant of all. In the kingdom, the way up is fast down. Somebody say different. You see, in the world, if you want more money, you become corrupt, you lie, you cheat, you do everything possible to get more money. But in the kingdom of God, it's different. Jesus said, if you want more, give, and it shall be given back to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running, it's a different way of thinking. Put your right hand over your head and say, Lord, transform my thinking into the kingdom. We've said, number four, that the kingdom of God is heavenly influence. On earthly affairs. Look at your neighbor. Tell them neighbor. Allow yourself. To be a prayer conduit. Through which God works. Can you say amen? So whenever we gather to pray. It's not a waste of time. We are pulling down the kingdom of God. And his will in heaven. Must happen on the earth. And we've said number five. That the kingdom of God is what? It is the believer's mandate. For transforming nations. Say together with me, I must adopt the platforms that my profession and skills have created for kingdom influence. Can you say amen? A teacher constantly has got pupils ahead of him or her. You can influence a generation with the agenda of God in that platform. Can I hear you say amen? Working wherever you are working, there are people you come into contact with. I pray that God gives you grace to be able to minister to them the kingdom of God. Can you put your hands together for the word of the Lord tonight? Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Close your Bible notebook and stand up. I want us just to take one or two minutes to pray that the kingdom of God will indeed come and his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I don't know where you are in your life or what circumstances you're dealing with, but there's one thing I know, that if you can pray, the kingdom of God would come and his will will be done in your life as it is in heaven. It's a simple prayer. Lift your hands and ask God for his kingdom to come and for his will to be done in your life and to be done in everything that you touch and you do. Lift your voice, church, and pray that that kingdom will be manifested in and through your life. God is releasing grace right now that you are going to become a people that will extend his kingdom, will extend his kingdom, and his will is going to be done. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that your will shall be done in our lives, in our families, in the work of our hands, in the ministries that you've called us into, into the work that Father you have separated us unto. I pray, oh my Father, let your kingdom come even upon the young, upon the old, upon the men, upon the women. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in the name of Jesus. Whatever the enemy has planted against your people, tonight we pray that there will be a shift in the name of Jesus that the kingdom of God will indeed be established
in the lives of your people. Father, this is the year. This is the year for kingdom manifestation. Manifest it through our lives. Manifest it through what we do. Manifest it in the calling that you've given us. We thank you that the kingdom will indeed be established and your will will be done in our lives as it is in heaven. Father, I take authority over sickness and disease. I take authority over situations, circumstances that have impeded your people. I decree in Jesus' name, let the people of God be healed. Let the people of God be delivered. Let the people of God be restored. Let the people of God be blessed. Receive your breakthrough. Receive your answer. Receive your healing. Receive your deliverance. May the kingdom come and may the will of God for you be done tonight as it is in heaven. It will be so and it cannot be otherwise in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone shout, I receive. Shout, amen. Now clap your hands together in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, celebrate. Come on, lift up your voice and glorify the name of Jehovah.